Hello, I'm Elizabeth Connors, a member of the MIT Committee on Campus Race Relations. This video is the fifth in a series entitled, It's Intuitively Obvious. The series was conceived to stimulate and encourage honest conversation about issues of race on the MIT campus. Originating from a seminar taught by Dr. Clarence Williams entitled, Bridging the Gap Between Racial and Cultural Diversity, Four videos were produced in which black, Asian Pacific, Hispanic, and white students spoke about their group's views and experiences of race at the Institute. This video, inspired by that project and sponsored by the Race Relations Committee, brings together participants from the first four videos for a discussion across the lines of race. We'd like to thank Dr. Williams and also Mohammed Abdesabur for valuable conversations and practical advice that led to the completion of this video. We also extend very, very special thanks to Keith Bevins, Teresa Lau, Gustavo Aritzabalaga, and Georgiana Rivers who appear on this tape and who organized and prepared the group for the discussion. It is understood that this video does not present a complete picture of the many cultures that form our community, and we encourage you to contact the Race Relations Committee with any ideas you may have. We encourage faculty, staff, and community to watch and listen carefully and to find ways in your own areas to enhance community building and to improve race relations here at MIT. Uh, what we're here for today is to do some kind of follow-up on the other four tapes that were made. Um, the Race Relations Committee was left with the question of where do we go from here and what do we do with the four tapes. Um, the timeline was running out in terms of having a discussion like this because the black students tape was made three years ago. So the freshmen on that tape are seniors now. Um, so we figured we'd at least get this project done before they left campus and then decide what happens later. Uh, somebody asked me the other day, um, what do we expect to happen on Sunday when we bring all these groups together? I don't know, none of us know, and the Race Relations Committee doesn't know, but we do know that we're going to try and find out by the end of the day. For this part of the discussion, I, I guess I'll start it off again and say uh, I'm curious to know what other people thought when they saw all four of the tapes. Um, I know when I watched the four tapes uh, the other day, um, I was kind of angry when I finished watching the tapes. Um, I saw a lot of the, the people of color had the same issues on campus, and I also saw that they talked a lot about their own experiences, and the white students on the fourth tape talked about us. Um, and I'm curious to know what people, how people felt about that and what, what kind of reaction they had to it. And um, it ties it not only to MIT, but it ties the discussion to these people in the room because we were all part of the first tape. I feel like, I don't know, I was, I'm, I'm kind of, like, I have questions about why it was made anyway, because I feel like, I feel like white views are expressed all over the place. And I didn't, I didn't feel like I was hearing anything new. But how often do you hear white views on race expressed in an open forum? Um, a lot, look at this forum. Anna and myself showed up. MIT is, what, 45, 50, 60 percent white. And one, two people out of, you know, 15 or whatever showed up today. I think the importance of the tape is to get everybody's, the importance of the tape series is to go full circle and to get everybody's viewpoints and to see, you know, what everyone had to say. Um, I didn't see the other tapes. I've since seen them two, two to three times each. Um, and it raised some points when I did watch the videos again. And I did see the other cultural things. And there were things, there are things on there that I agreed with. There are things on there that I disagreed with. But at least I took the time and I got the viewpoints. I think that was important for me. Um, I will say what I thought. When I, when I saw the tapes, um, it seemed like three of the tapes focused on, like, I guess what Keith was saying, experiences and culture. And, and tape number four almost seemed to look at me and say, why are you here? Um, what are you doing here? And how dare you come into my sacred space? And I thought that that was really, I mean, a after a while, I just thought, you know, why am I getting upset over this question? 
my right to be here was decided in May of 1992. Um, to look here and see like people sitting here as if they're like, you know, the second admissions committee debating over whether or not to let me continue here is just pretty stupid. I mean, they're not CAP. They're not uh, the Committee on Discipline. They're not the admissions committee. I'm like, so to sit up here and actually debate and say, um, one comment that stuck out was some guy said that um, we're the only students who should actually feel like um, we were admitted based on our merit. <laughs> Uh, in effect, saying in, a, in effect, saying that um, we should feel superior because uh, we know we got in based on merit. Um, I will say that uh, I really did lose my capacity for intellectual reasoning right then, and it was basically going on gut instinct when I could have just—I don't know—I don't want to say what I could have done. Um, <laughs> let's let's suffice it to say that um, just on the sake of pure argument that. That just seemed to just that seemed to be just way out there, um, and and then I start to wonder, how can I possibly think about educating someone like him, to say, okay, here I am, you know, respect me, respect my culture because I'm here at MIT and I think you should want to learn from me, and I from you. How do you even begin to approach, take that kind of approach with somebody who's basically indicated he doesn't even want to see you here? Mm -hmm. I had the need to define myself when I came here and all of a sudden I was being labeled, I was, you know, getting calls from the department saying, oh, we want to take pictures of you to put in the brochure because, of course, I was the only Puerto Rican in the department, so they needed to show diversity, right? <laughs> so there's, there's this sense that um, we need to, it's, when, when you're in danger, I mean, and I, I'm coming here from a, a Latin American perspective where uh, I've seen struggles of many kinds. When you're in danger, you, you start defining yourself and you start you know, bonding, okay? But when you're in power and you're it, and you have the sense that you're it, there's no need for you to call yourself a culture or a race because you're it. I mean, to, for people to say there's not such a thing as an American culture, just turn on the TV, I mean, Oh, the all-American guy. What's the all-American guy? He doesn't look like me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't that to be the but that's what this. But that's what society is telling me. Yeah, that's true. That's, yeah, that's what true. society is telling me. I mean, the Puerto Rican guy is killing everybody and shooting. I mean, like you know, cops is the show where like most yeah. Latinos are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But just as society tells you things that you feel are totally inaccurate about yourself, I can understand how a white person might feel that the image that's being portrayed of them is not who they are personally. Well, forget, <laughs> I think everybody needs to be aware of that. Forget society. I mean, I, I kind of felt when I got here, and this is, I mean, my views on this have already been taped and recorded and shown, <laughs> um, that, that MIT has told me that, that it views me a certain way and that MIT looks down on me. And to sit and watch those tapes and see the white students actually saying that they look down on me and that they don't consider me their equal, even though that I came through here with a great GPA and a lot of other things going for me, you know, to, to, have, that, to have that feeling verified on tape and to actually see a white student on my TV set telling me, yes, well, I feel I got in here because of my merit, and you're here because MIT decided they needed to fill some quota. You know, I mean, yeah. what is that? that? That pretty much ties together my sophomore year to now I'm finally graduating, that sums up how I feel about MIT. And I know that when I explain it to somebody and they tell me, well, you're just looking for racism, I say, well, look, I found it. You can look at the tape. Mm. When I first came here, I thought that, you know, we would all be worshiping at the altar of academia and racism would be left behind. <laughs> I was like, okay, it's just gonna be so great because we're all gonna be, we're just gonna have too much work to do to take time out to make other people feel uncomfortable. I mean, and so man, did I, so you just can imagine how frustrated I am to see it like bubble to the surface time after time. And um, it just, after a while, it just gets, you know, really flustering. Um, one more comment. It seems like oftentimes when people speak of American culture, when you say the word American in America, it automatically symbolizes white. As if somehow the people who are sitting around this table are not as American as anybody else. Mm -hmm. I can trace my roots back in America till about 1830. 
Um, let me let me speak on that point as well, because um, I watched the tape and, and there was two points that that I saw that they were um, quite ignorant. Uh, one point was made by uh, Jason Selinski. Um He said that um, it's like we're running a race, and uh, this is the way this is the way he orchestrated. And you see, the bad thing is nobody really convicted him on this and really showed him where he was ignorant. In the edit. <coughs> oh, in the, <coughs> in the edit? Yeah, the tape. And the meant. actual conversation was five hours long. Oh, okay. Then, <laughs> amen. Then, all right, fine. You go. Just uh, to set that I'm glad. I'm glad <laughs> somebody did. Um, <laughs> but he, he said, oh, okay, so, but, but, but just because I didn't see it. Yeah. The, the mere fact that he said, all right, we're running a race, and you have all the quote-unquote qualified people up here at the front, and you have all the handicapped people here in the back. <laughs> And cripple. Cripple, cripple, I'm sorry. <laughs> cripple people in the back. And so, oh, slightly, slightly crippled, crippled handicapped Whatever. without arms. Um, he said, now, you don't equalize a society by holding back the people in front. And I was like, well, wait a minute. Affirmative action is not a hold back of the people in front. What it is, is it's a wheelchair <laughs> for the crippled, <laughs> to use this example. Or it, it's, it's, I don't know, it's, it's something where at least we can run the race, <laughs> you know? So, so, so that example was, was very poor. But to even, um, and that just permeates on, on the ideas of, of this quote unquote notion of America. Uh, I, had, I have a problem when people separate American history from black history. Um, it's all American history. You see what I'm saying? And although black history uh, was instituted said this way, we can find out of our contributions to ourselves. If you look now, even in, in uh, the education um, that we've had prior to coming here, that black history is not even incorporated within or made to be a part of American history. So naturally, when you have the students who are coming here to MIT, to this institution, naturally they're going to believe that, hey, when we talk about American history, we're not talking about the blacks because they have their own history, which is separate from American history. And say, no, it's all one history. I mean, the first, the first person to die in the Revolutionary War was a black man, Crispus Attucks. So it's, it's kind of like it, it, it disheartens me uh, even to the point where you have white folk who know about it. And this is, this is my main point. You have white folk who know this is wrong, but they don't speak up. And I think that that's my main peeve. Um, in the first and third tapes, I think on more than one occasion, um, <clears throat> there are people on the tapes who are talking about um, their experiences at MIT and they're saying stuff like, well, you know, if you're a white student at MIT, you don't really have problems. And most of the time, that statement was, was actually stated as, well, you don't really have problems at MIT if you're white or if you're Asian. And then on the white tape, it was the exact flip of that, which was, um, well, you know, I don't really, this is totally paraphrasing, but a general feeling that I got from the tape was, I don't really understand why minorities are, are, you know, sort of saying that they have all these problems, especially Asian people. So it's kind of, for me, a reaction for me is that on the one side, there's like, if you're Asian, you're, you know, you're, you're might, you might as well be white. I mean, there's so many of you here, it's not really a problem. And then on the other side of that is that, you know, you are a minority, you're definitely not a white person. And in fact, you're the kind of minority that is best because you just shut up and graduate. So that was a reaction of mine. I'm an immigrant. And like, so people ask me, where are you from? And I, and I say, I'm from LA. And then they say, where are you from before? And I say, Florida. And then they say, you know, well, where are you born? And I'm like, OK, I was born in Bangkok, fine. You know? <laughs> and, and then they ask me, when are you going back? And I mean, it's really hard because I go to Thailand a lot because my dad, well, my dad lives there now, but he just moved back because I guess he felt the frustration of, of not being able to assimilate. And that's why he decided to go back. And he's living there now. 
And I don't feel like I have a sense of place here. Like, if I go to Thailand, I don't fit there. I don't fit there at all. Like, people see me on the street and they're like, that's an American. <laughs> or they're like, that's, that's just not a Thai person. I mean, they, if I'm sitting down, I'm not saying anything, then it's fine. You know, I look Thai. And I can, can get away. But as soon as I open my mouth, as soon as I walk, as soon as they see how I wear my clothes, anything, you know, they're just like, it's not a Thai person. And I come here, and I'm not an American. And I think that's a, that's a thing I talk to a lot of, a lot of other Asian Americans about, is about having, like, no sense of place. There's nowhere that you call home. And I mean, I've, I've entertained the notion of going back to Thailand, you know, whatever that means for me, because it doesn't really mean anything for me. Um, and I can't. It doesn't make sense. I mean, I don't speak the language very well. I don't understand the culture very well, and I just don't fit there. But I don't fit here either. Yes, I feel the same way. I go back, and I'm a gringo. I come here, and I'm a Latino. I'm, I'm you know, Puerto Rican. And, um, and the same thing. I'm asked for my green card all the time, you know? And uh, so it, 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 it does happen, and it happens at MIT. It does not, I mean, like, people, when people say things like that, they say, oh, that, that happened to you in Central Square? No, it happens here at MIT. Not only the administration, but also, you know, the people that work here, all the students. You need to excuse yourself for being here all the time. But the thing is, like, I can see that a lot of students around me feel that they belong here. And they're made to feel that they belong here. And they belong in academia. And they're encouraged to go into academia. And this is something that I was talking to Keith the other day, is that my choices haven't been the obvious one. For God's sake, they haven't been the logical ones. You know, for me to go to graduate school is not logical. For me to go into biology graduate school is not logical. Because when I look up, I don't see any, anybody like myself. No, I'm the first Puerto Rican to get admitted into the biology PhD program. I mean, and it's 1996, you know? I mean, so it's, it was not the logical choice. And, and, for, and, and I can see that, that it's instituted. This is not something that just happens sometimes. It's instituted. I see it when I TA. I see how the professors deal with the students, OK? I see how Asian women are completely ignored because they do fine, they just do well. They're completely ignored by the faculty. They don't have problems. I can see how, you know, they see that the, the Latino women or the black men, they're encouraged to go into medical school. Now, the good lab person in lab that's white, oh, you should go to graduate school. Do you want a Europe in my lab? I've seen this. This happens. This is instituted. OK? And, and I, it, it's extremely scary to me because uh, uh, I, you know, like for engineering, you can always fall back into uh, industry. I'm stuck. Mm -hmm. I'm really stuck. I hate it. I hate it because they, I mean, they've sucked every single, you know, hope out of me. Because I, it's what Keith was saying. I see myself, you know, the other day I saw the video, right? And I was looking at me. I start crying. First of all, I had hair back then. Second, <laughs> second, you know, I had some hope. I had some, you know, there was some meaning for me to be here at MIT. There was some meaning. I could, I, I could justify that I was getting into academia because it was going to be good for me and for my people. I can't say that anymore. Because if I'm going to get into academia, I have to forget about my people. I cannot remain Puerto Rican. I cannot remain having an agenda and be within, within academia. I cannot. Because it's, it's not valued. It's a waste of time. And it deters you from what is real. Okay? For, for them, it's real. It is very difficult. And like, I, don't know, I just wanted to say that that's not necessarily I just wanted that to be out there, that it's not something that it's just an issue for people of color. It's not. And, and I realized, like, when I went to this graduate school seminar, you know, like, my whole ideal, like, you would, to get into college well-rounded was, like, great. To get into graduate school, they want you to have, like, 500 undergraduate courses in your major. They only look at your major GPA. Like, they don't care what else you do. They don't, you know, and, like, to me, that's something that was just very disturbing. The thing is that they don't, 
they don't care like what kind of person you are. They just care about your grades and how much you know about chemistry. But the thing is, like, I'm going to say this, not even believing that I'm saying it, but I'm going to. Um, that sometimes it seems to the point where um, there is almost a white bashing that goes on when minorities talk about um, the things that you know they've had to withstand. And I'm not bashing white culture at all. What I would like to say is that there are things that every culture does. Um, there, are, there are things that every culture has that may not be so good, individuals in every culture that may not be so good. But um, rarely does are those people in any positions of influence so that they that their negatives so often wind up on my shoulders. Um, one of the things that scared me about watching the video was that I was thinking, here are people who are at MIT. These people are going to be somewhere in position of power, supervisors, managers, something of that nature, where they will be deciding who gets employed and who doesn't. And what criterion will they be using in that decision? Um, what will they think when they see they're in a position of authority, a black student from MIT hands them their resume? Will they be thinking, here's a student who graduated from MIT? Or will they be thinking, here's a student who probably got an MIT who shouldn't have been there in the first place? Let's get rid of his resume because it's not even worth looking at. Um, that kind of, and, and these are the people who were, uh, shall we say, brave enough to actually appear on video. This isn't talking about the ones who probably felt their views were so, ex so far to the right that they wouldn't even get on video to espouse them. It's very important not to generalize that to all white people feel this way. And it's been done. It's been said earlier in this conversation that the people you have to worry about with racism are the white people. There are other issues involved there. It's been said that I watched the video and all I heard were white people saying, none of these minorities belong here. I was there. Um, I definitely didn't say that. I know Georgiana definitely didn't say that. I know there are several other people in the conversation who didn't say that. There were two or three people who are way out there who I do not agree with, who I feel no loyalty to, that said things that were way out there. But you can't say, it's very important not to put that on me, because I, or to anybody else in that video, because you have to respect their independence. It's like, that's what that white person says, or that person. I mean, it's not all white people well, are feeling that that's way. That's true, but. Yeah. Wait, because I, you know, wait, OK. Now, OK, ideally, right, you know, I, I should not generalize or whatever. But, you know, for my, for my survival's sake, you know, um, there I have to I have to be aware that the likelihood, you know, you know, a certain a certain people thinking certain things is great, you know, you know. Let's put it this way: it may it may in a sense be wrong, okay, but it's done to me, you know, for 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 reasons that are much you know less um, valid than you know why I would do it to someone else. You know what I mean? So I don't walk around, I don't think most of us, you know, walk around thinking, you know, oh yeah, that person is, you know, such and such. You know. But at the same time though, you know, I'm I'm aware, you know, that, you know, there's there's a great chance, you know, for that and it can't be ignored, you know. Um with, with that comment even, um, I think it's gotten to a point where it's not so much where where uh, we perceive as all white people being this way. But it's kind of like if one white person espouses this view uh, verbally, it's gotten to the point where we're not surprised anymore. And I think that is the travesty. And I, I think that um, the, the solution to that is when people such as yourself uh, go back and educate your own, educate those people who, you know, who do these sorts of things. because. <coughs> What I see here, and, and what I wanted to say earlier, is that what I've noticed is that we have, we have talked about our hurt and our pain, about feeling these sorts of things, about experiencing these sorts of things. And uh, talking about this hurt and the pain has also brought about feelings of cynicism and, 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 and lack of faith that, that things won't change. And I would say, and I would put forth a challenge to the whole group, is that if we are to set a new course for what America is supposed to mean, we can't lose that faith. Because we're, you gotta, what we have to understand is we're probably some of the most conscious people on campus. And if we lose the faith that we can change the face of America, then who is going to? 
oftentimes we are American only when it suits the dominant group for us to be American. Um, Michael Jordan would not be described by anybody as a black guy. Yeah, there's a black guy named Michael Jordan. Yeah, Michael Jordan's American because he's making like 35 mil a year or whatever. Um, however, it's like when we're here, the fact that the fact that we're American, right, or the fact that we're all equal, sometimes seems to get lost in the shuffle. Um, like back in the, I guess, I, I hate to go back in this history lesson thing, but back in the 60s, when black people were trying to say, aren't we all equal, or aren't we all Americans, society was saying, no, we're not. And we're going through this gut-wrenching thing. Now it seems as if society is stealing the language of civil rights and affirmative action to basically say, we shouldn't have affirmative action because we're all equal. And it's like, mm -hmm. how come we weren't all equal then and why, in order to roll back something that was even, to, let's put it like this, even if affirmative action was a, a wrong solution, it was a solution, and it was a solution to a particular problem. And now what it seems like to me is a lot of people tend to concentrate on affirmative action and say, that's the problem. The racism that gendered affirmative action, the societal institutionalized racism, that permeates society, that permeates MIT so that the faculty remains predominantly white, predominantly male, is not even questioned. However, what is questioned is how did this one black person get here? The problem is that the admissions office and the, um, the school itself are striving for different goals. The admissions office seeks to bring a class, a diverse class, to the school in which they know that we're all interested in science and technology, and that's, you know, that's our co sort of common bond. But they try to bring, bring people from different life perspectives, different backgrounds, different cultures, nationalities, to this class so we can learn from each other, and we can learn, um, uh, we can learn to live in a pluralistic society and learn and obtain a social education as well as a technical education. I can't believe that I'm actually going to defend Rush and Aro because I think it's really stupid. But, um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but kind of along with this conversation, um, I have to say that there's a time and a place to learn about other things and to have to teach other people about your culture or um, things that you know or things that people want to know about you or you have to represent your whole race or your whole ethnicity. Um, and so in some ways, like, to have a place to go home to is really important, you know. And I think if it's gonna, if we're gonna say, you know, MIT is the bad guy in this conversation, then maybe what there could be more of is opportunities, more times and more places to have like interaction, to have people that want to talk about themselves and want to represent their whole race or whatever, um, so that they have opportunity to do that. But to kind of take away people's homes, you know, people's places where they don't have to explain themselves, where they know that if they say this or that, or if they like make this or that food, people aren't gonna look at them, maybe not even condescend, but sort of exoticize them and say, what are you doing? Explain yourself. Like, who the hell wants to explain themselves, you know, all evening when you've been at school all day? Like that's so so to have like a place to go home to, I think is really important. I still can't believe that I'm defending RO, <laughs> but, but I mean, if, I think if it was a longer process, then I think you would be, I think people who think that if you just get rid of Rush, that things like Chocolate City, things like um, Next House is like, I don't know how many percent Asian, things like that aren't gonna happen, they are gonna happen. You know, people are still gonna be more comfortable with people that they know, with faces that they recognize. I really appreciated that I felt like MIT treated us like adults. The fact is that when you come here, you're not an adult. You know, you're 18, for the most part, <laughs> not everybody, <laughs> but... <laughs> but people in general are young, okay, and you're very impressionable. I don't think that just getting rid of our would make the difference. I think that the living groups ought to be places that foster interaction, all of them, that foster interaction and expect interaction and really have things to promote that. You know, I, in my living group and in, in the vast majority of the living groups, there's a tutor there who's this, you know, 
sort of random grad student. And they're expected to be there and generally supervise, but they, it is not their job to, which it, I think it should be, to really get students to interact and to get people to know each other. You know, I tried to start a little thing on my floor of um, having like international potlucks. So people could come and bring something of their food and then explain why this was important to them. And I thought that was really neat. But things like that don't happen that much. You know, it wasn't until I was a senior that I started to catch on, you know, this really needs to be done. And the other thing that I wanted to say that, um, yeah, I mean, I, I spent a lot of time in CC, too, as an outsider on the inside. And I know all the arguments. <laughs> Interacting in class, just because you go to class and you aren't seeing black people all day, that's not the same as the people who you hang out with, the people who you really get to know. You know, you go to class, I don't remember that many people from my course who I didn't become really good friends with. And most of the ones I became really good friends with were actually the Latinos. There were ones I already knew. And those were the people who I hung out with. So I don't think classes foster social interaction. You know, you might even get into a study group and you might study with someone, but you still don't necessarily get to understand each other or get to know them. I think that there needs to be a balance between the support structure of um, having a living group like Chocolate City um, or like a next house and so forth and so on, uh, and then broadening the perceptions of understanding other people's races and other people's cultures. I lived in New House for three years. We were right next door to Chocolate City. I could go home whenever I want. It didn't hamper me from getting to know anybody else of any other race. So to, to even look at um, Chocolate City as an entity that uh, uh, says that, hey, we are exclusive, uh, uh, we are exclusive group, we do not allow anybody else in, et cetera, et cetera. To even look at uh, Chocolate City in that fashion would be incorrect because there have been many people um, who have come through Chocolate City's way who have, uh, and, and I'm not you know, just defending Chocolate City, I'm talking about just any living group. Um, there's many people who have, I've walked in Next House and talked to Asian folk. So it doesn't stop me. I think what, what you know what I'm saying? But, you know what I'm saying? So it, it doesn't stop me. It doesn't stop me. And I know that sounded funny, but it, it, what I'm saying is, what I'm saying is, it doesn't stop me from trying to interact with different people just because I have a living group I can call home, you know? Um, I think we need to, to distinguish between preference, prejudice, and racism. There are two times when MIT students actually talk about race issues. One is in a situation like this, and the problem with this is that the people who are here actually care. They don't, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're here of their own free will, and they're here because they want to talk about it. They're not, you're not reaching out to the people who really should be discussing race issues in this sort of forum. And the second time you discuss it is when there's a problem, which is usually what happens when one of these people who's, can, who has realized that at MIT, you can live in an environment where you really don't have to interact with any other cultures. You can open the technique, you can look through each you know, yearbook, and you can see that at MIT that there is a great deal of segregation by race within the housing system. MIT has a policy, or not a policy, but a set of bringing, a way of bringing people to campus that brings this about. Something, it's not just RO, it starts before that. Um, MIT has programs like Interface. What happens in Interface, a lot of minority students come up early. The other students in the program who they spend most of their time with, who they get to know, are also minorities. And when RO rolls around and everyone has three days of confusion, a lot of students try to stay with the people that they're comfortable with. RO is a very uncomfortable time. It's very stressful. A lot of things are going around. And if you already know 30, 40 people, odds are you spend a lot of time talking with them. A lot of people, especially people who may be in the majority on MIT, <laughs> um, don't feel that diversity is an issue that affects them. They don't feel that, um, they don't know that there's a problem. They don't, they're just not, a, I mean, to, for a large sense, a lot of people just aren't, aren't aware of the importance that diversity has on campus, I think. One thing that I've heard in common here, it's, it's that we're sort, that MIT is sort of out of bounds, okay, that so people are saying, oh, getting rid of our role is not going to help it. 
Absolutely. I think that getting rid of our own and just grabbing everybody and putting them in there, you know, and say, okay, confront each other without, like, without <laughs> having an environment that's, that's <laughs> where true. confrontation, it's, uh, because confrontation can be good, right? I mean, confrontation don't, like, this, because I think that in, 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 in an aspect, we are confronting each other here, confronting each other's views and so on uh, in a respectful manner. But if you just put him there and say, okay, 20, 20 percent, 20 percent, deal with each other. I think that that's wrong. I think that also saying, okay, you guys decide uh, without you know, any, any other things around already set up so that, that what the housing is not doing, other things can do, also that's not being done. Also, the, the balance between personal responsibility and an institute responsibility, right? I mean, w when my <laughs> students, when students look and see that the faculty it's all white and it's mostly men, right? Why do they have, why do they have to care about diversity? The campus doesn't, obviously, you know, academia doesn't. So why do I have to care about that? So I think that to say that oh, it's all, it's only false in the students. I think that that's also wrong. I think that there's, we have to keep balance. I think that the administration has to do some things. I think that, and when I say MIT has done some things wrong, MIT is not just administration; it's also the student body. I don't think that speeches and lip service and, and little diversity-oriented activities during RO are enough to, for people to really understand the importance of diversity. Because in 94, I entered in the um, fall of 1990, the big theme for our RO was diversity. We saw the slideshow. We had um, little discussion groups. But the discussion groups, they said they were required, but nobody went. And the people who went were the ones who cared. So it didn't really matter. And so I think the forums where you really learn a lot about other people and learn to get along with different people who, are, who come from a background that might be um, a little bit different from yours is not in any of these sorts of organized forums, but through just uh, working with each other, living together. And at a place like MIT, where, where I, I don't know how each person would probably estimate that they spend a different proportion of their time studying, but I'm sure it's like at least more than 70%, right? And it's really difficult to, <laughs> it's really difficult to, to do extracurricular activities. And most of the extracurricular things that we do are like IMs with our living groups. And, um, you know, if we have any free time at all. And so I think that whole living group situation is really crucial in, in the whole self-education and growth process. And we're talking about balancing personal responsibility with, with, um, the institute's responsibility, and and I've lived in three different dorms in the four years that I was at MIT. I started at Next House because I wanted to learn about my culture and whatever, um, and I got sick of it after two years because it seemed really insulated, and uh, you know even though I was living with people of color, I don't think they really realized that they were that that they were people of color. They all thought that oh, we're just normal people, you know, living our normal lives, and sure we get along with other people, but none of these issues that, that we think of. Maybe, maybe in certain cases, we're, we're making more of them than they actually are. But, but um, for a lot of people, Asian Americans especially, they don't realize that they're, they are a minority and that when they graduate from MIT, life isn't going to be easy for them or it's not going to be the same for them as it might be for their non-minority friend. You know? And so then when I moved, I moved to Bexley next and I met a lot of different people, you know, different other kinds of people. And I moved to East Campus at the end. I kept moving left. <laughs> and um, <laughs> literally, too, I think. And I, I learned a lot from that. But not everybody is like me. You know, Not everybody's going to choose to keep moving, trying to find their own niche. A lot of people, they find their niche in the first three days. They, they find their little group of friends. And they stay with their friends for the rest of the four years. What I've noticed is that um, Whenever we talk about the issue of, of diversifying people or uh, uh, getting people to mix together, um, people always focus on taking those living situations in those groups and breaking them up within the majority, quote unquote, uh, uh, white culture. I remember speaking to, um, talking with uh, one of my white friends having lunch with him. And he says, tell, them, tell me. How come, how come, all, you know, every time I come into Labda, all you blacks, y'all sit together. Why, why is that, you know? And so then I says to him, well, 
I have a question for you. Who, who did you have dinner with last night? My frat brothers. Okay. Well, what are some of the things that you have in common with your frat? Well, we all, we like uh, music. We have this certain kind of music. We love Star Trek. We love... So I was like, well, if you have something in common with them and you decided to sit with them because you had something in common, what makes that paradigm any different from the paradigm of black folks sitting together, Latino folks sitting together? If Latino folks sit together and, and speak Spanish to each other and you don't know Spanish, then, then maybe, just maybe, <laughs> You know, why would you want to go and break that group up? They feel comfortable speaking Spanish with each other, understanding each other, loving each other in that way. If black folk, we're talking about rap music, or if we're talking about some, some issue, we're talking about Farrakhan, or we're talking about some issue that affects us, and we're sitting down discussing it, why would you want to break that group up if this is a family meeting? And it wasn't until after that point in time that he got the picture that he understood that people are, people some, uh, in, in many senses uh, sit with each other and interact with each other because of, of their commonalities. Now, what he has done is taken himself out of his own comfort zone and says, well, teach me a little bit more about this culture. Well, I'll say, well, let me introduce you to one of my friends. You see, but there's a level of humility that he had. And that level of humility inspired me to even want to, to encourage that same level of humility myself to want to learn about other cultures. But unless you have that level of humility, how, you, how would we ever expect the races to come together? And, and why must we expect those who are trying to make a home for themselves to break up? That is highly illogical. A lot of the black people, uh, I would say, you know, definitely more than half of the black people on this campus, um, you know, in certain in decreasing numbers over the past two decades, you know, go to predominantly black schools. A lot of us, you know, a lot more of us now than before, also um, are, you know, more so moving towards middle class instead of lower class, uh, private school versus public school, you know, less inner city schools and stuff. We. I let me speak for myself also. I, I spent, you know, my whole life except for four years, which I feel were very, very important. Um, my whole almost my whole life was spent, you know, in private school around, you know, very few black people, you know, always being, you know, the black per one black person in my class or, you know, in the honors classes at least and especially AP classes and it's that kind of thing, around, you know, white people. You know, if you talk about, you know, a diverse education or, you know, me being exposed to you know, people of other cultures, I've been bombarded with that my entire lifetime. You know, um, there is not very much of an opportunity for me to be in, uh, live around a group of, you know, all black people. It's just, it doesn't, it didn't exist before, right? And considering the fact that it didn't exist before, this is basically the only time I'm gonna have. Because after I get out of here, you know, I'm going to be successful in life, period. And the more successful as I am, the less of a likelihood there's going to be that I'm going to be able to interact with more people of my background, of my color, um, later on in life. You know, you go up and you look at the number of people. Like, there's, I think, 35% Asian undergrad here. You know, grad drops to, like, 17 or 16 or something like that. You know, even the people who are, you know, normally minorities who are quote unquote overrepresented minorities here in undergrad, once you, you know, hit to the next level, they drop, you know, in half. You know, blacks drop from like seven percent to two and a half or three and a half or something like that. And then you introduce the next one. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean it falls off exponentially. I'm not gonna have another opportunity to live amongst people of my own culture, you know. Um, I, on the flip side that you address, there are a number of people who you know, did go to predominantly black high schools or whatever, or, you know, did, were always around people of their own nature, black people even, who, you know, have gone up and got here and went and joined white fraternities or went to, into other living groups because, for, for that specific reason. You know, they had that self, sense of self, whatever, whatever, and they decided, okay, now I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna learn. I'm gonna, you know, go, you know, gain a better understanding of those other people. But for myself and for a lot of the people that, you know, do quote unquote self-segregate, 
you know, uh, or in my terms, do you know, live amongst their own, we didn't have the opportunity before, and we're damn sure not going to get the opportunity later. So, I mean, we're taking advantage of the opportunities that MIT has provided us with. There are not that many people here that came from predominantly black high schools exactly. anyway. So, so when, when we talk about what is, whether one thing is the exception or the rule, I think that we need to ask a broader question before that. Is it the exception or the rule that black students from inner city high schools who do not get necessarily have access to uh, an MIT, do they get in at all? And then we can ask, that question, whether it's the exception of rule, whether they go into predominantly uh, white fraternities. Yeah. I really wanted to address this whole comfort thing, you know, because we keep coming back to it, how um, we want to live with people who we're comfortable with. And I think it's a notion that really ought to be challenged. Not that there isn't a lot of truth in it, but to really challenge the notion that color defines who we're comfortable with. Particularly if you come here and you're 18, and you don't know about pe other people. You know, yeah, you might have gone to high school with them. The majority of people here of color did not go to schools of mostly color. You know, not from my experience. All the people I knew went to mostly majority white high schools. And personally, from being from San Francisco, I had a really diverse high school. Um, but it wasn't majority black. It wasn't majority Hispanic, anything like that. You know, it, the majority was still white. And I think if you haven't gotten to know somebody on an adult level, then you don't know whether you're comfortable with them. And just because the people who you knew in high school, back home, you weren't comfortable with them, that doesn't mean that all white people you aren't comfortable with them or anything like that. That what I think is that we have a very exceptional population here. There's a lot of students with really interesting qualities that you haven't been exposed to. You know, there weren't that many people at my high school who had qualities like of ambition and interest in the world that the people I knew here had. And I think it's a whole different ball game that you really need to get to know people and be in environments where that's really fostered. So you know, people will see you in class, they'll talk to you in class, they'll say, hey, he's pretty good, you know, wow. You get outside that classroom environment, and boy, it's almost like sometimes I have to like touch myself to see if I'm still here because it's like people who you look at and say hello to, they kind of look right through you almost. It's like, pew, you know, I have to look to make sure I'm still there. And it's, it's kind of, that's kind of frustrating and it leads to a real cynicism as to how is it possible to really change the underlying attitude so that when you first meet me, when you first see me, you, you ascribe to me those qualities that you ascribe to any other human being and not necessarily wait until you get to know me. For example, if you get to know me, will you then look at Keith Bevins and say, here's Keith Bevins, another MIT student. He's got to be pretty cool, too, because he's here. Or will you say, here's Keith Bevins. He's a black guy. I don't know him. So now he's just like any other black guy. But I know Marlo, and Marlo's all good. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was just going to say, I live in, in um, Newhouse, and I'm a senior, and I have to admit that I only know like three or four people that aren't black at MIT, but I think um, even though that's the case, I'm still glad that I lived in Newhouse for my whole four years because of the support I received from my friends. And it's not that just black people, um, I'm, I could only be friends with black people, but it's that the probability of me getting along with those people and having less conflicts with those people is higher. You know, if, if the music they're playing really loud next door might disturb me, but it might be something I like at the same time. So, I mean, that's why I think it's still valuable, because these people have supported me. It's not like I'm the only token black person there, you know, where they're like, oh, what does the black girl think about this or that, you know, and not really accepting me into the community. Or when I'm walking down the street, and like, if you were to see me walking down the street in Central Square, say, okay, now, what I think about you is going to be an issue, but what you think about me is also going to be an issue. And it could be that when I'm walking down the hallway and somebody of another race walks by and like, I feel that I get some sort of look or whatever, I instantly might feel uncomfortable because they assume that I'm racist. And that's something that I've had to try to deal with. Um, and combat. I mean, like, it's, it's hard. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm.
when, when I'm walking down the street <laughs> and I say, see a white woman come in the other direction or whatever, <laughs> and we're, you know, passing in the night or in the day <laughs> or whatever. I don't see this, you know, white woman and assume, oh, she's white. She must be racist. <laughs> yeah. But when I'm walking down the street and there's a white woman walking the other way, and I'm doing whatever, humming or not, rapping or not, <laughs> and she glances up and then glances back down, yeah. you know, you clutches her stuff and makes this big you <laughs> kind of, <laughs> you know, just, you know, circle. <laughs> circumnavigates, you know, a good extra, you know, a couple of feet around me. You know, I don't necessarily then assume that she's racist, but she's damn sure uneducated and, you know, <laughs> prejudiced pred about some things. I'm like, look, man, I, 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 don't, I don't hurt anybody. I don't, you know, whatever. You know, I ain't never raped nobody. <laughs> you know, any of that. I, you know, why people, why I got to be like that, basically. <laughs> you know, but, you know, when people do that, that's when, you know, I'm like, there goes another one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you wanna, in response to that, if you're walking, can I say something real quick? Yeah. I have the opposite experience of that, and that is taking it from Central Square to MIT. I walk down the halls of MIT, and I'm walking, and I got like my workout bag because I went to the gym this morning, and I got my backpack, right, and I have like maybe two books. So I'm walking, I'm kind of taking up more than the usual amount of room that I take up, but I'm walking down the hall. And there's these two white guys with frat shirts on coming towards me. <coughs> I move out of the way or else I'm going to get knocked down. They, they, it's not like they see me, they look down, they make this wide berth. It's like they look up. I don't know if they see me or not, but they don't really care. I, I think it's that... about. I, I think I'm going that, here. I just she's going here. I'm talking about she goes. She goes she's this, here already. Here. You know, we're not going to hit. Wait, I just want to. I'm not saying they're separate. I'm saying okay, these are like the same. These, these sort two of like similar things. Wow. You know, they don't move around me. They move through me. I've had that same thing happen. Like they just act like they don't see you. Like you're invisible. Oh. You know, they'll just stomp you right down. Like, yeah, right. but I guess oh. if I was a white girl or whatever, I don't know who I might have to be. But you know, <laughs> just, uh, you know, maybe <laughs> move no, or... <laughs> I think that happens to everyone on campus. I mean, oh, man, probably not necessarily but in the I've same never probability. But I've seen a black guy, you know, like... stomp me down, you know, or some other people just um, walk through me. Since I've been at MIT, the same stupid little things happen to me all the time. And we talked about some of the seniors that were on that tape three years ago talked about this. So obviously, not a lot has changed. But the same stupid things that happen where I become the exception and the, the one nice guy in a sea of badness, or you know, I become just, just the exception to the rule that I'm no longer comfortable with that because I don't, I don't need that aggravation in my day anymore. I don't need to go to Baker and, and have someone, you know, have three white people walk right through the door and then, you know, slam the door on me and make me call the desk when the desk worker sees me standing there. I don't need to go to Baker for that. I don't need that frustration in my life anymore. You know, and that's why I'm not comfortable going out anymore because it just, it's just extra aggravation that I don't, MIT is hard enough. I don't need to put myself in situations that are going to make it any harder for me. I think like one solution for MIT might be having everyone to have to take a seminar like Clarence Williams offers as part of like the credits in order to graduate. It's only six units and I think that would be something feasible and maybe just like have a discussion and a conversation on a regular basis throughout one semester just like you have to go take all those PE credits which I'm sure most of us don't really need. Mm -hmm. So I think this would be a much more productive use of our time and it would also, you know, it would, I would learn something and everyone else could learn something about the other groups. So. Make sure that that's in the final I, 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 I agree. I, I was just going to say something on that also. <laughs> writing it down here, um, about the need for some kind of cultural history course, you know, and uh, I took Clarence Williams' seminar also, and, and I, I thought it was really, really interesting to see the different perspectives, but um, I think there's a real need to get away from, as, as you pointed out, just preaching to the converted, you know, just giving these things to the people who really care and go out and look for them. You know, MIT finally turned around a couple years ago and made biology requirement because they thought there was a need for students to understand 
cells mm -hmm. uh, and life, mm -hmm. right? Now, I, I think there's a need for students to understand whole people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think there should be a requirement <laughs> for, for a course <laughs> on people, you know, and understanding people and getting to know people. And it could have cultural history, it could be literature based, or it could be just seminar based. But I absolutely think that it should be required. I think a lot of schools do it the wrong way. They say you have to take a certain number of courses that will focus in on one culture. Mm. And Hispanic students take Hispanic culture courses, and black students take black culture courses. And, and that's fine, and that's part of your education. But you don't, it doesn't fulfill the, the intent, which is to have people learn about other cultures. Um, mm -hmm. That's why I think the plus to the way Dr. Williams' seminars or classes have been set up is that you kind of invite, you invite everybody and everybody who shows up and you talk about the broader issues like what we're doing today. It's sort of like a weekly version of this. Mm -hmm. And that's a, lot, that's a lot more productive for me than mm -hmm. learning a lot about one culture and one history. What here at MIT is rewarded, OK? In the job market, what is rewarded, right? As you say, if you go and educate people, that's not going to show up in your CV. You know, that's not. And, and, and uh, at MIT, you're not a better person if you take this seminar. You're a better person if you took seven you know, electrical engineering courses. That's, that's who you admire. In terms of uh, having a course that can, um, that can really add to a, a requirement on, on learning about people's you know, different, different cultures and so forth, I would say that you know, the, the course that, that, sh that we should have is probably like introduction to human deprogramming or something, something to that effect where we take um, all the assumptions that quote unquote American and world history uh, has taught us through the American educational system and then s outline all the myths and, 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 re and replace those myths with actual facts. Like for example, I took a class um, it's called Political Dimensions in African Civilizations Over the Centuries. Very long name. 17573. We were talking about Egypt. And we had, uh, it was a pretty diverse class. And we talked about how Egypt is not set in the Middle East. It's set in Africa. And that the pharaohs in Egypt were from Nubia. And that the, 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 the history of Egypt is not one that you see similar to a Ben-Hur, a Cleopatra movie, but, but it's, it's more uh, of the faces um, and the people that, that you, know, you, you would see in a black community. Like, these are the actual faces that uh, existed on the faces of the pharaohs. The white students in there couldn't believe what, what, what they were hearing. They were like, wait a minute, the Egyptians are not black? What are you talking about? And it, and it took a considerable amount of time for Willa Johnson and myself and, and several other people in the classroom to actually convince some of the white students that, hey, uh, Egypt didn't start changing um, quote unquote faces. First of all, they didn't even look at themselves as races back then. There was no such thing as race. Race is a social construct which is, which is uh, preeminent after Gambia, after the first slaves left from Gambia. So, but in, in terms of that, Egypt didn't start changing its face until after the 26th dynasty. So those are the types of things that we never learn, that I did not learn until coming here and having to seek out a class like that about my own history and my own culture. And I'm sure I'm not alone on this. I'm sure there are a lot of cultural misconceptions that have been programmed into students before coming here and people think, well, hey, I don't have to take this history class. I'm at an engineering school. It doesn't matter. It does matter, because when you have to relate to somebody else and you know nothing of their history, and you've been programmed with all these negative stereotypes that are not necessarily coming from racist people uh, uh, that exist in society, but are actually coming from the schools that you go to, there's a general problem. And just as MIT sees it fit to put a biology requirement in there, they need to be some sort of human deprogramming of history uh, 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 requirement in there. I think it's really, really, really important that, like Georgiana was saying, how she constantly questions you know, her own prejudices. And the white people are not the only people who have to do that. You know, all of us need to do that constantly. And I don't think you can rationalize making generations 
uh, generalizations or, you know, biases or prejudices just because you are from a disadvantaged background or a disadvantaged minority group, you know, to say that, well, you have reason to generalize this statement of the white student on the video because you have to do it to survive. I don't think that's good enough, you know. I think that, yeah, we all need to have a certain street smarts, not just when we're on the street, but in dealing with people, that not everybody is going to be nice to you. But I think you really need to constantly try and assess, are you feeling biased towards this person because of their skin color? And if so, you know, what can you do about that? And how can you try and maintain a certain neutrality when you meet someone and open-mindedness to that person and meeting them and who they are, you know. And, and lastly, I wanted to say that um, an approach is not a solution, <laughs> you know. Like affirmative action, I think, has its pros and it has its cons. And you have to always keep in mind that it is an approach and it deserves to be questioned and reevaluated, you know, as there is no perfect solution. It's my hope that this video will be used for, uh, for whatever educational purposes in living group situations or seminars to, uh, as a starting point for more discussion, further discussion about diversity and learning to get along together. And the last thing I want to say is that even though it's hard for every individual person to, to pursue this struggle, it's really important for everybody to make a commitment to themselves to continue with it in whatever capacity they feel is right for them. I definitely wanted to end on, on a positive note, um, the way I feel about this project. I think this project is, is definitely one of, one of the great steps in the right direction. Um, this, this tape needs to be shown to uh, people who it, it's going to matter um, a lot to. and, and in, in many respects, that is the faculty. The faculty of MIT definitely need to see this tape and need to understand where students are coming from. And um, for those students who are, are trying to fight to understand and, and, and trying to uh, rid this, themselves of stereotypes and so forth and so on, I would say don't get discouraged. Um, and I want to share the scripture before I go. Um, it's in Philippians 3.12. It says, not that I have already obtained all of this, or have already been made perfect. But I press on to take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers, I do not consider myself to taking hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And I, and I leave that scripture because this is a scripture that I go back to whenever I feel down. And I think the most important thing about this this video series has been that it, by getting people to talk about it and by educating not only the people in the videos but the people who watch the videos, you're going at the root of the problem. You're saying that why racism is bad. You're, show, you're giving concrete examples from personal experiences. <coughs> What's nice about these videos is it gets people to talk about issues that don't come up at the dinner table and gets it out to the open. And I wish more people were involved with this sort of project. Well, um, I guess I'd just like to say uh, I started the day being quite cynical. And um, basically, everything I've said up to this point indicates the depth of my cynicism. Um, I will say I have ended the day being maybe just a smidgen less cynical than I was before. <laughs> maybe even slightly more, you know, whether I want to use the word hopeful or optimistic. I'll just say less cynical. I'll, I'll start to use the word hopeful when I see some substantive change. Um, I will say this. Um, what needs to happen is, like all the people here, it's, it's unfortunate that the only people who came to make the video are the people who probably don't need to see it. Uh, is I really wish that those people who need to see this video look at it and try to understand and question their own assumptions and basically start treating people independent of the stereotypes that they have of them. The suggestion of having um, 
uh, this tape and discussions of this sort actually be a class for credit um, is something that I think should be done with the tapes. Um, because, you know, in this country in general, and I think probably with people in general, uh, the whole value thing, if it's made, you know, something that's valuable, it gives you uh, impetus to actually do it because that's what it boils down to. You know, not only here, but in the real world. You know, you're going to have to deal with people. Um, so I think that's, that's what I would like to see done with this and uh, with things of this sort. Uh, for myself, um, I don't think I uh, am necessarily surprised uh, by anything that I've heard or uh, shocked or disturbed or whatever because I've, you know, come across it like many times before. But um, I guess for people who are watching this video now, you know, whenever in the future, and for the people here, um, I guess my biggest, you know, challenge or whatever you is, you know, just um, be honest with yourself and, um, you know, realize, uh, not realize, but just kind of stick to, you know, your ideals uh, and don't let, and, and, when, and when you are in a position of power, like, don't forget the things, you know, don't let the, like, cynicism, like, or whatever, like, destroy the ideals that you have now. Because, you know, someone mentioned before, if you don't do it, no one else will. Um, that's pretty much it. One of the things that I hope would come from this kind of project is that people can look at the first four tapes and see a lot of what it's like for them. I mean, they can look at the first four tapes and say, yeah, it's really easy to say how I feel when I'm around people that are like me especially if they're like me in terms of race and the issue is race. It's very easy to sit around all black people and talk about what it's like being a black person. But I think the importance of this discussion is that it shows people the types of how to attack the problem and how to have a respectful discussion. Because coming in here, I wasn't really sure what to expect. And I wasn't sure that this discussion would be not low key, but it, it's a very respectful discussion. And I don't think people as a whole know how to have a respectful discussion about an emotional issue. Well, for me, um, viewing these tapes was very educational. And I would hope that would, aside from what everybody else has said, is that um, the administration would watch these tapes and try to make some steps in order to um, put forth some of the solutions that we brought up into effect so that some of the students that come after us could benefit from this discussion, you know, viewing these tapes, maybe coming up with um, various programs that can be implemented that, are re that will be required for um, future students. So that's basically all I wanted to say. These videos are a very good way of um, sparking discussion um, amongst other groups, like the class um, I ran over IAP through Clarence Williams. We watched all four of the videos and um, discussed each one. And we've continued the group into the term to try to actually look at some solutions to a lot of the problems that um, have been raised. And that's been a very, very rewarding experience for me. I've been gone from MIT for two years. And um, over that time, have been become increasingly ambivalent about my experiences here. Um, but I, I still do think that there's a really, really particular set of people that comes here that has a lot of potential. And we are, they are very young. And that potential needs to be really flushed out in the most positive way possible. And that's one thing I think MIT has been absolutely um, irresponsible with as far as really treating the students like adults and um, abnegating its responsibility as an institution to educate us about people and about ourselves and to encourage us to also educate ourselves. Um, and for me, the critical thing here is race relations. You know, I went to the Latino video, and my understanding at least was that it was about racism, you know? And I went there and I didn't have that much to say. I didn't have much experience with racism in my time here. I, ha I knew a lot of friends who did, I knew anecdotes, but I have a lot to say about race relations. There is so much that needs to be worked on in the way of race relations at MIT. There's so much self-segregation and just 
isolationism then happens at MIT, and I think this is a really dangerous environment because people are working so very hard that you only have time really to do sort of like one extra thing, you know. This MIT has to, uh, again, after faculty see it, I mean, start to place emphasis on uh, what I think is probably one of the most important points that uh, Gustavo made earlier in that it's not valued here and MIT needs to make a way, like find a way of, of making sure that people understand that this awareness, that this understanding, that this respect for other cultures is going to be valued uh, by the institution and that it's going to be valued uh, once we get out of here, you know, in the quote unquote real world, because it is um, in many different ways, in many different situations. And it's going to be helpful to all of us to, you know, have a better understanding of where the other people that we're going to be dealing with are coming from and what their perspectives are. You know, at the MIT really needs to, you know, find a way to make sure that that is emphasized throughout and to everybody, to the faculty, to staff, administration, and to the students, uh, that it is valuable experience for people to understand each other, you know, as well as themselves. I don't, I don't have a lot of hope. <laughs> I'm just kind of generally a pessimistic person. <laughs> I think because I don't like to be disappointed and I'm really disappointed a lot, so I just try to, I don't know, I guess look at things not expecting a lot. Um, so I guess what I hope to see happen with this video is that it's just a catalyst for people to start talking, at least more than they have already. Um, and, and maybe, maybe something will change, but I don't know, I don't really believe that. Um, I would like to see MIT like institutionalize some real changes so that students don't have to keep like coming, you know, every four years, have to start the process over again, have to keep reinventing the wheel, you know, to get anything done. And in my experiences, when I was here and I, I was doing my committee things, um, that was really the biggest uh, stumbling block because I saw that there were students who had the commitment, there are people in the administration who have the commitment. And there is a shamefully low number of people in the faculty who have the commitment. And what I think might be interesting, perhaps we, it may or may not be possible to get them to take the class, um, but have student-led faculty discussions about race relations and get them to talk in front of students about their feelings about race and do a discussion like this. The, I think it's interesting because as soon as a room full of faculty see that, they're going to say, well, you don't understand what it's like to be faculty. Mm -hmm. And when they say that, I will say this. Students put in a lot of effort and a lot of work into things that are important to them. And if race relations aren't important to you, then they should be. And, and you need to make certain time. You ask students to make time for your class, to make time for other things. Um, you, they need to make time. I, I don't think that, I consider myself fairly well exposed to the administration at MIT um, through different committees and through different activities that I've been a part of. And race relations is a priority in this vague sense of multiculturalism that they, that they lip service to freshmen in their pamphlets and stuff. But it's not something that department heads make their faculty do. If I have tenure, you know, <laughs> what are you going to do, fire me? You know, I don't, you know, that, that's the attitude that I see. You know, it's, it's a matter of a few well-meaning faculty carrying the burden for the entire faculty um, because they have too much research to do to have some kind of social agenda. I'm here to do research and you make me teach and now you're going to make me talk to, to students too? You know, what are you, crazy? Um, but I, I would really challenge the faculty, you know, to make this a priority because this is what the students want. I think this conversation has pretty much given them, us, the charge, you know? This is what we want. We want this class. We want these things to happen. We want discussions like this to get publicized all over campus. We want them to happen in different forms and in different manifestations. Once, once people see this, they're going to say, well, yeah, we could have this class, but that'll cost money. Man, we're not going to be able to find a classroom. 
and who the hell has time to teach something like that here? And then they'll just blow it all out of proportion. Somebody will write a 35-page report on what came out of the meeting, and it'll get put on a shelf. Um, I know because I've seen those kinds of reports, and they're really sad to read because they come out every two years on the same, on the same issue. Um, and, and I don't think that we're asking that you know, we, we just slap this grand program together and just change the face of MIT in a year. Mm -hmm. But it is something that you know, the faculty really need to start thinking about really attacking the problem and not, and not being presented with a the problem, then making it grow larger than life because they keep throwing so many different facets on it like some faculty do, even on the Race Relations Committee. You know, a problem will come up and they'll throw so many throw many, so many aspects and so many details to the problem that it gets too complicated and we just got to put it away. Things are not getting any better by simply ignoring them. Um, what you ignore can hurt you and to, and to simply pretend like it doesn't affect you because you're not a member of, let's say, a particularly disadvantaged group, it's not necessarily true because in the end it will. So I think that personally people need to kind of unite behind this effort. Um, people, who are, people who feel this way but who are too quiet to speak up, um, as well as the people who feel this way and want to do something about it, need to get together and unite behind the effort to enlighten the campus or, or something like that. And this is coming from me, the, the cynical guy. <laughs> so, so please, I mean, yeah. if you don't do it for yourself, do it for me. <laughs> <laughs> but when issues like this come up on this campus, everybody shuts up. Nobody has any bright ideas. You have a room full of the, the Michael Jordans of academia, and nobody, has one, and nobody has one single idea. And nobody has one single idea. And then that makes, that, that, that makes me wonder, you know, as I'm sitting up in these committee meetings, you know, a black student sitting there with some administrators and some faculty, and it's very discouraging to see that that happens, that when it comes to grading policy, everybody's full of bright ideas on how to go around the system. But when it comes to race relations and instituting a new class or a new requirement, Nobody has any, everybody's stupid. In response to like people making excuses like, oh, how do we get this class started, whatever. I've started two classes now through Clarence Williams. And basically, like the IP seminar, I just went to him. I went to the IP office. I picked up a form. I said, can I do this for credit through you? He signed the paper. I wrote up the plans for the class, and it was in existence. I mean, Clarence it was. Clarence fired now. <laughs> You've just gotten Clarence fired. <laughs> and it was like, I mean, it, but I'm saying, like, it, I called the scheduling office. I said, I'm having this class over IEP. It's this course number. Give me a room. You know, like, <laughs> I mean, it, it's not like a complicated thing to do. I mean, I guess it is t in order to get, like, the funding or whatever. And then when I went to him, because I wanted to have the same group of people from IEP continue on with something this term, I mean, he was hesitant to give us credit at first. But, I mean, the day before ad date, was when we created the, the independent study class, and then everybody added it, and then, you know, I mean, like, <laughs> it can be done quickly and, and, you can do it. and easily. You yeah. can do it with a full schedule, <laughs> with no time on your schedule. Exactly. And, and that's, that's a real shame that, that <laughs> on top of being students, we have to do these things. It's not our job. I mean, it's not my job to have to go back to Puerto Rico to recruit students to come to, to, to MIT. I'm not getting paid by MIT to do that. I mean, these are students that are going to produce for MIT, that are going to give papers to the, to the, the professors at MIT, that are going to bring grants to MIT. And I don't get anything. I don't even get thank you. you know? And it's not my job. You know, it, 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 and that's the shame of it. That's, that's the, the travesty of the whole thing, that we are doing what they should be doing, and, and that we're not, I mean, that, that's not our job. That's on top of our thing. And it actually bucks us down, because then when we have you know, our research is going to suffer from that. It's absolutely going to suffer. And, and it's a sacrifice that we're going to end up making. In response to that, I kind of feel it as members of the MIT community. It kind of is our job. But it's also, that doesn't mean it, to say that it's not the job of the faculty and the administration. I mean, they actually get paid for it. But as students here and as contributors to the campus community, you know, it's our responsibility. And, you know, the same way if you want to apply it to the whole country. like. You know, as citizens, we, it's our responsibility to vote and to contribute and whatever. But 
The problem is too many people don't see it that way. <laughs> I have one other quick note just to have this on tape, is that um, one of the Latino students that left made the point that there are no Chicano students here, and they are a large part of the population on this campus. Um, so just let's keep in mind that their voice was not heard in this discussion. Okay. I always, I always hear how MIT is at the front of change in technology, in science, in discoveries. We're always changing, we're pushing that change, you know. All these discoveries, all the Nobel Prizes are here at MIT. There's a lot of change. And that's one of the things that attracted me to MIT, you know, all that change. But I came here and I have never met a more fearful, more scared group of people of change. Hmm. This institute as a whole, student body, administration, faculty, it's scared to an, to an extreme of change. Not change in technology, because that's what they're in control of. It's the change that they're not in control of. It's a change of face of this campus. It's a change in attitudes. It's a change in the way we, we educate, not train, educate our students. I think that hopefully this, this videos um, give them a, a different sort of fear, or the fear of the, of, of, of the things that are out there and that are happening to the students in this campus. And that they're not just mere speculation, that they're actually people out there that have these horrible thoughts that we've described before for years and years. Okay? I hope that, that the people that see this get afraid of our future if that is to continue. And then they, f they see that the balance you know, will go towards changing the phase, because changing the phase will stop you know, changing this attitude, you know, continuing the attitude that's, that's detrimental, not just for, for the minority students at MIT, but for every single person. Racism no, does not just affect us, the minorities, it affects everybody. It's something that was told before here. It denigrates every single human being in this society, whether we participate on it or not. And we're all part of it. And I, I hope that this video gives the people out there some courage to actually change things, to actually change the face of MIT, to actually change the face of our faculty and the attitude and the, the and the value system of academia so that it can include more people, not exclude people as it does right now.